Coming up, it's a week of joyful cheers in Kansas City, but it's also a week of mourning and of tears. Also this half hour, the prosecutions begin. Kobach files his first voter fraud charges, including against a Johnson County couple. Plus, as the boys in blue dominate every news outlet in town, we bring you some of the stories you may have missed. This week's news hand delivered to you in 30 minutes or less straight ahead. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes, pouring through those stories with pithy insight and wisdom, keeping you up to date weekdays from 11 to noon on KCUR FM, Steve Kraske, engaging you in a conversation about the news every weekday afternoon from 2 to 6 on 98.1 FM, KMBZ Scott Parks from The Pitch. Reporter Steve Vokrot is with us and reporter, columnist and blogger, Dave Helling. Now, if you watch the local TV news this week, you might not even have seen a break for a weather update. It was wall-to-wall -wall Royals coverage. Orlando on his horse back there to make the catch at the wall, and it's with that exclamation point that the Kansas City Royals move on for a date with the Blue Jays. That 7-2 win over the Houston Astros sent Kansas City to the American League Championship Series for the second straight year. The pitch newspaper in their new Best of Kansas City Awards edition, declares that the best thing that's changed in Kansas City in the past year is the Royals winning, beating out other picks, including Kansas City's new soon-to-be operating streetcar. Is that really the best thing that's changed in Kansas City in the past year, Steve Ogra? Well, it depends on how you look at it, but I mean, I... S the, the, the type of civic pride and the, t you know, the, the way that the community kind of comes together in a way with, uh, with this extended postseason baseball run and the excitement is, is a good thing to see. And I think, uh, um, you know, it's, 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 the news is covering it a lot, but if you talk to people, you know, I was getting my hair cut this morning, it's the only thing people are talking about right now. For all of the hoopla, the best thing that's changed in Kansas City over the last 12 months, Scott? I, I think probably from just the way the town feels about itself, Yes, it's something that everyone can rally behind. I don't think everybody's rallying behind a two-mile streetcar line, not to take away from the importance of it and what it might mean for the future of Kansas City. But to Steve's point, you can't go anywhere in this town right now without people saying, how about them Royals? And it shows you, I mean, I've lived in this town for 30 years, and we, as a town, have, have watched some really bad baseball. And <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> horrible really? baseball. And, and I think, it, it, you know, and, and let me add one, one thing real very quickly. These guys are easy to like. With going down to the Power and Light District after games and buying people drinks, they seem like genuine, nice guys. Rich, but genuine and nice. And, and, and they seem to have kind of hugged, if you will, Kansas City, and Kansas City's hugging them back. If you were filling in that form on the, uh, for the award there, Steve, the best thing that's changed in Kansas City over the last year, would you be putting the Royals? I would, Nick, and if you think I'm going to disagree with that idea, on the day the American League Championship Series begins, you've got to be kidding me. I couldn't agree <laughs> more with what Scott just said. It is the story of this city right now, and everyone's picked up by it. How can you disagree with that? Okay, well, Dave always likes to be contrary. Come on, Dave. Well, my <laughs> agreement with all three of my okay. colleagues suggests that they're right when they say that good performing sports teams are one of the few things that communities can always agree on. We disagree on the light rail or education or spending for Medicaid. You know, we're here every week talking about those disagreements. But when a sports team performs well, virtually everybody can get excited about that success. One other thing that I think is true in Kansas City with the Royals is we really have a sense of how ephemeral sports success is. It isn't like New York or, or you know bigger towns where you think, well, every two or three years we're going to make the playoffs. I think Kansas City realizes enjoy this now <laughs> because we could be in the desert for another 25 years on the other side. So you put those two things together, glorious weather. Uh, you know, if we, you're watching this show on Friday night, Nick, you're probably not doing it right. The game is on another channel, so <laughs> no, come this join is us on Sunday. Right <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. You know, the Kansas City Star headline this week, Cheers and Tears. We talked about the cheers, but it's been more than a quarter of a century since Kansas City lost multiple firefighters in the line of duty on the same day. This week, two firefighters lose their lives after a wall collapses on them while battling an expansive blaze at an apartment building near the intersection of Independence Avenue and Prospect. The Royals held a moment of silence 
silence before their playoff game Wednesday to honor 43-year-old Larry Leggio and 39-year-old John Mesh. Earlier tonight, in the wake of the tragic events on Monday and the loss of two Kansas City firefighters' lives, the Royals honored their memory in a special pregame tribute. Select players and Ned Yost will wear official KCFD caps and shirts to honor the fallen firefighters. And our best to the families who were touched by that tragedy. I was looking through the statistics, and in the last 20 years, though, there have been just five Kansas City, Missouri firefighters who have died in the line of duty So before this latest tragedy. So this reminds us, though, that this is still a very risky job, Steve Kraske. You know, of course it does, Nick, and those pictures of the daughters there crying in that pregame ceremony, I will remember that for a long time. I think what struck me about this particular tragedy is that these firefighters weren't inside a burning building. That's always the image I have in my mind when I think of firefighters in in, in danger as they go about doing their jobs. They were actually outside the building putting water on it when the uh, exterior wall collapsed on top of them. I'd never heard of something like that happening before. And again, obviously a very stark reminder of the unexpected dangers that these people face day in and day out. Everybody always wants to learn lessons from these kinds of tragedies. What are the lessons that we learn from this? I saw one of your colleagues at the start, Dave Helling, Lewis Duguid, talking right. about the need for more inspections, particularly a lot of older uh, building stock now in Kansas right. City. And particularly on structure, you know, buildings uh, periodically are inspected for fire uh, alarms and sprinklers, but in terms of actual structure, I think the public has some uh, expectation that buildings are looked at annually. That's not the case. And particularly in aging structures in the northeast part of town, you know, some of the buildings there are 75, 100 years old. And so you hope that, uh, uh, you know, people who run public policy in the area will take another look at how we keep our eye on structures like that. And the other thing is firefighters will study this incident, as they always do in a fatality, to make sure they're responding correctly. Uh, and, and there may be some discussion as to whether they needed to be as close as they were to the building, that type of thing. That's another important lesson going forward. He is the only Secretary of State in the nation with the power to prosecute voter fraud. Now Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach this week is using that newly granted power for the first time. He's filed charges against three Kansans, including a couple from Johnson County, who he alleges voted in both Kansas and Arkansas. A third Kansan living near the Colorado border is also charged with voting in two states. All three of these double voting Kansans are registered Republicans. So does that take away from the criticism that Kobach is just playing partisan games on this issue, Scott? Not necessarily. I, I think, you know, and, and Chris Kobach has been an incredible lightning rod for controversy, especially over uh, voter ID and these allegations that there's double voting going on all the time. He had to file something. And um, it, it, while I, I think it's a little bit petty, I would also point out that if these allegations are true, what they did technically was illegal. Uh, speeding's illegal, and sometimes they let you go on that as well. But, but Kobach, to keep his credibility, and, and I think that's suspect sometimes, uh, intact, had to do something, and he needed people who he could find that voted twice, allegedly. But, but even it, with three people here, I mean, there are summer elections, and when we've seen them in Kansas City, where, where, where elections have been decided by just one vote, Steve. Yeah, well, you know, it, the quotes from these individuals were pretty uh, revealing. They seem, sounded pretty confused as to what they could do, what they couldn't do, what the voting laws were, and you didn't get a sense they violated something intentionally here. You know, I think the pressure remains on Secretary Secretary of State Kobach here. Democrats have been pounding him for, for a couple of years now, saying there aren't, isn't that great a problem with voting fraud in Kansas. He's filed three cases here. What's the number going to be for Chris Kobach for him to prove his point? There is a significant problem here. Is it 20 cases, 50, 150? I think he's got a long way to go to demonstrate that this law was worth fighting for and that the state's got a big but, problem. But there was the gentleman near the Colorado border who said, well, I didn't vote for president in both both elections at the same time, but I, I, I wanted to vote uh, in the local elections in both Kansas and Colorado. He seemed very deliberate about that, Steve. Right, and I think the case he was making is that he owned property in both areas and he lived So he knew what, what he was doing. Seems that way, but he may have been confused about what I think whether he right. was doing was illegal or not. And, you know, the issue, the issue as I see it on this is 
It's like any other public policy issue. There's a balancing act. So you have three prosecutions so far, but on the other side of the equation, you have thousands of Kansans who've had their voting rights suspended upon further review. What's the balance here? And I think to Steve's point, how many more prosecutions are we going to expect? At the same time, even though it's three, you have to remember, I mean, we live in a Kansas City area where, you know, just earlier this year in Wyandotte County, there was a race decided by one vote. A few years ago, we had another race decided by one vote in the Missouri side for state rep, where the winner's <laughs> family had cast two votes when they were illegally voting in that yeah, district. Right. And so, you know, progressives will say voting fraud is not a big issue, but it can be. And I think to my other point is there's a balancing act in Dave, this. Dave, I would just add that I don't think Chris <clears throat> Kobach's uh, entire agenda is based on eradicating voter fraud and in that sense 50 100 cases won't matter in terms of the impact he wants to have because when somebody sees a prosecution of a voter fraud case uh, who someone who wants to vote but may be confused about his or her own status tends to be poorer voters younger voters they just won't go to the polls that's the whole point I don't want to get caught up in something that I don't understand I'm just not going to vote and risk a prosecution from a guy like Chris Kobach. So in that sense, one prosecution is enough to send the message to voters who may doubt their own eligibility to just stay away from the polls, and that's called voter suppression. That's why cases like this and why, uh, why the criticism is so high of uh, pursuing a case which, let's face it, was a vote in 2010. It was five years ago. It isn't as if these cases had a great impact on the decisions that were made then. Millions tuned in this week to watch the first Democratic presidential debates. Let's face it, when it comes to politics, most people's attention is transfixed on the race for the White House. But there's a blunt campaign being waged in Missouri, too. Politico has moved Missouri into their top 10 most competitive Senate races to watch list. Missouri Republican Roy Blunt is being challenged by Democratic Secretary of State Jason Kander, which, according to a public policy polling poll, is at five points behind the incumbent senator. Is Roy Blunt vulnerable? And if so, why are we hearing so little about this election, Steve Kransky? Well, he just might be a little bit, Nick. He still remains the heavy favorite to win. He's out raising Jason Kander by three to one, a very strong uh, uh, margin there for sure. But, you know, there's, there are questions about Senator Blunt. One is, what's he done for you lately? Can voters point to something that Senator Blunt has done? And the other is, has he become a creature of Washington? Is he more associated with D.C. than he is Missouri? Certainly, Democrats are going to make that case and make it very hard here in the months to come. So, you know, Jason Cantor is competitive. It remains to, to be seen exactly how competitive this race is going to be. While the focus is on the presidential race, there are just as many people, it seems, running to replace Jane. Nixon as governor of Missouri. Less attention on this race, though. In the battle for the White House, is this a story of political outsiders leading the polls? Is that playing out in this race, too? Well, yes. I mean, Eric Greitens uh, is one of the announced Republican candidates for governor in Missouri. He's never held office before, has a pretty sparkling personal resume, military service, that type of thing. John Bruner has never held office. He's a candidate. He did run for office but lost. But he's a businessman. He's a businessman. Um, Catherine Hannaway, of course, was former Speaker of the House. She's been around for a while, but she will make the case that I'm really a mom and I'm a lawyer and I haven't been in government for 10 years. I mean, one of the things, and then Peter Kinder, of course, who's the lieutenant governor and Bob Dixon, fills out the five-person field, state uh, senator. Senator or representative? One of the two. He's yeah. in the legislature. Yeah. Um, but, but, but my point is, in this year, the person who, at least at this point, can argue that he or she is outside of government the most, has the weakest resume, tends to be the most popular, particularly in the Republican Party. And we may see that play out in the governor's race if a Greitens or, to a certain degree, if a John Bruner can, can make it competitive, which I think is going to happen. So, um, you know, the best, I wrote this story a couple of weeks ago, the best resume is no resume at all. That tends to be true, political resume, that tends to be true at the top of the ticket and maybe for governor as well. But, but in And by the way, may play a part in the Senate race, too, because Jason Kander is a relatively new figure to the scene, never served in Washington, as opposed to Roy Blunt, who's been a part of politics for a quarter century. Kansas Governor Sam Brown 
Rombach is not up for re-election next year, but that doesn't mean he isn't facing just as many headaches as those elected leaders that are. Kansas revenue might be off by more than $100 million by the end of the year, according to some leading Republicans in the state. Kansas is already more than $42 million short, but the governor says don't expect any tax hikes. Uh, so what does the state do to fill that gap, Steve Kresge? Well, certainly looking at more budget cuts, Nick, and uh, critics will say the likely target's going to be the Department of Transportation, the highway fund, money used to keep the roads maintained and build new highways. That's the, a piggy bank that Governor Brownback can go to get easy money to fill, us, uh, fill his budget in a stopgap sort of way. The governor had always said, though, that it would take time for his tax cuts to bear fruit, Scott Park. So should he be changing course? Ooh, that's a good one, Nick. Um, <laughs> he would tell you no, um, and this is a man I've known for over 20 years. Um, he is amazingly charismatic person to person, and he is amazingly stubborn. And uh, I think it would be a cold day in hell when Sam Brownback admits that he made a mistake on this tax cut experiment. And he will tell you um, repeatedly, just give me more time. Well, that seems to be the one thing he doesn't have a lot of anymore. He's had nearly three years, you know, and for Governor Brownback to back away from these tax cuts would be like President Barack Obama saying, I'm going to back away from the Affordable Care Act. This has become the centerpiece of the Brownback administration. Having said all that, a lot of lawmakers, Republicans included, conservative Republicans, are telling me that if these numbers don't turn around by January, they're going to start taking some actions to, to refill those cuts. Who will succeed John Boehner as Speaker of the House? It seems no one wants the job, or is it hard to get any enough people? to rally around anyone who does. Could the next speaker be from Kansas? The Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Pompeo. Buzz is growing that Wichita area Congressman Mike Pompeo may be the compromise candidate that can appeal to enough House members to win the post. A Twitter account with the handle Mike for Speaker is gaining traction. Most people in Kansas have never heard of Mike Pompeo. Why would the 434 other members of the House think enough of him to vote for him as Speaker, Dave Helling? Well, his bona fides in the Republican caucus are pretty good. He's got a military background. He's on, I think he's on the Intelligence Committee in the House. Um, and is seen as a figure of some substance, uh, and yet his conservative record and his approach to conservative issues make him acceptable to at least some of the conservative wing of the Republican Party, which includes, by the way, Tim Hewell's camp of the first district. So, uh, you know, as a fallback candidate, perhaps, although, you know, there are dozens of uh, legislators, House members, who, whose names are now surfacing as a potential compromise choice in that race, there's no indication that Mike Pompeo is head and shoulders above that field. We'll see what happens. Are you holding your breath on that one, Steve? I am not, but, but David is right. This is a Harvard Law grad, a West Point grad. Uh, he has a certain level of respect, and he's a bridge builder. He sort of goes between the hardliners and the rest of the GOP caucus. Stranger things have happened, Nick. Kansas Congressman Kevin Yoder is in the hot seat this week, facing an ethics complaint over campaign donations he received from the payday loan industry while backing a bill loosening regulations on payday lenders. The complaint from the Campaign for Accountability comes in the same week that a new study shows Yoder took more campaign contributions from the payday loan industry than any other member of the entire U.S. Congress over the last four years. What's Yoder's response to all of this? Steve? Uh, Yoder has said that this is a uh, more or less of a smear campaign against him. Um, in, in one sense, this is how politics work. Uh, people get funded by outside interests and they tend to reflect with legislative action what those outside interests are. In this case, it's not really any different except for the fact that it's the payday loan industry which increasingly is taking on a uh, uh, a, a, a sense that it's a, it's a it's a predatory industry, and uh, there's fewer and fewer people who want to be associated with. He it. didn't have huge opposition last time around when he ran for re-election. Mm -hmm. Scott Box, does this impact his electability? I don't think so. Not necessarily. Um, it will certainly come up. Um, but then again, when he jumped naked into the Sea of Galilee several years ago, people <laughs> said that was going to be a huge campaign issue, and that called into question his his moral. Uh, turpitude, and, and it never really came up. It certainly didn't affect his, his chances at re-election. But in politics, image is everything. And sometimes perception can become reality. And this, this is not the image, I think, that, that Kevin Yoder wants, is that he's in the back pocket of such a, a, an industry that has such a horrible, 
horrible reputation. Steve, yeah. uh, um, you know, people uh, talk all the time, Nick, about the dysfunctional Congress, and particularly the House, they argue, although the Senate has its own problems. And one of the reasons that the dysfunction in the House is so high is demonstrated in the Kevin Yoder story, because in the third district, given the problems that he's had, not just with the payday loan contributions, but he was criticized for his uh, uh, insertion of a bank measure into one of the uh, recent bills that a lot of people were worried about, and of course Scott mentioned the, the other thing in the foreign trip, in a normal district, those problems would entice a Democrat, a strong Democrat, to at least consider the race if the district were drawn correctly or drawn in a way that was more bipartisan. Shouldn't say correctly because, you know, a court was involved or some part of it. But so in a normal House race, you would have Democrats who might become involved in a race against Kevin Yoder. Instead, he's got $2 million in the bank, no credible Democrat, so none of these problems are problems for him, and that means the seat is safe, and that explains why there's such polarization in Steve. In you know, what's Congressman Yoder doing messing around with the payday loan industry? Here's what he's doing, Nick. That's an industry that gives out lots of campaign donations. It's an industry that if you sponsor a bill that's favorable to them, your, your uh, coffers fill with cash relatively quickly. I think that's what he's doing, messing with this industry. And this is going to raise a lot of questions with, with a lot of people. Does it put him in jeopardy? No, he's in a safe seat, just as Dave says. But this does raise some questions, and it should. Well, maybe and let me just add on to that very quickly, and I'll do it in 10 seconds or less. He, he could be a congressman in perpetuity if he wants to. He, why would he need this money? Yes. Why would he take it in the first place knowing what this might do to his reputation? The Missouri Attorney General, Chris Costa, was in town this week, joining with local leaders to make a major announcement on mental health when Kansas City police pick up individuals who appear to be suffering from mental health problems. They currently have two choices, take them to an emergency room or to jail. Neither option is ideal. Now Kansas City is in a new place to take them, the Mental Health Assessment and Triage Center at 12th and Prospect. Inside, eight sobering beds and eight stabilizing beds where people can be held for up to 23 hours. We're told repeatedly, though, there is no money for mental health. So where is the money coming from to pay the medical staff, the building costs and equipment on this new facility, Steve Ocker? That was money set aside from the sale of some hospitals uh, from, a, from a hospital company. And it comes, it's not directly related to, but it comes right on the heels of Truman Medical Center a few weeks ago announcing that they would immediately close what used to be a state-owned state mental health facility. Truman Medical Centers took it over, found that they couldn't, they felt like they couldn't run it effectively due to some new federal and state regulations. So they absorbed that into their emergency room. And as you said, sending somebody with an acute mental distress into an emergency room is not always viewed as the best setting for them. And so this, uh, this announcement is uh, for, for mental health care advocates in the community at large is, uh, is, is, is a good one. But we're told it's a huge deal. However, if you can only be held there for 23 hours or can have received care for 23 hours, what, how much of a difference can that really make? Well, it's, you, you have to remember it's for people suffering from acute, uh, acute uh, mental health issues. So they're seen as a immediate threat to themselves or to other people. And for treatment, you want to get them stabilized and then move to an inpatient or outpatient which uh, clinic, which there are others in this, uh, in this area, such as research. Yeah, um, 2016 will be the year of mental health discussion in, in this country, Nick, because you mentioned that you know 23 hours in an emergency room may not be the best setting. Steve s s talked about that, but the alternative often is jail, where where jailers don't have the kind of expertise in mental health treatment that perhaps they should. And policymakers are really grappling with what's the best way to because you know half of the jail population may have mental illness problems in some communities. Now, Governor Brownback was in Johnson County this week and touring the uh, uh, jail facilities out in, uh, at the old naval base near Olathe, and the subject of mental health came up and he said, you know, I don't think the enthusiasm for the big 
mental health hospital, Osawatomie is the classic example, is there anymore. It's got to be community-based. And so communities across the area are going to have to be talking about strategies for short and long-term treatment of the mentally ill as a way to save money in jails, prisons, and to reduce crime and the other things that it's yeah, We're for. seeing a sea change on this issue, Nick. It's, this has been swept under the rug for so many years and decades in this country. Suddenly now it's taking a, a prominent place at the discussion table. Senator Roy Blunt of Missouri has uh, taken in a very active role on this issue. Very important that we have it. It's very, so a very that's, good thing. To, that, so to that's something it. that he's done lately for people already. Yes. Should <laughs> military veterans yeah. get free parking? They would under an ordinance being pushed at City Hall. Vets with designated veterans license plates could park for free at metered parking spaces throughout the city. It's part of a proposal by Council Members Scott Taylor and Kevin McManus. Parking is a huge source of revenue in Kansas City, so flush with cash that it now wants to give away that money, Scott? Well, I, I think this is a feel-good measure on the part of the city council. Um, I, I think you'll be hard-pressed to find anybody who would be willing to even vote against it. But, but how much money is the city really going to lose? You would have to care enough. I, and, and keep in mind where most of the veterans in this community live, they live around the military bases from which they retired. But uh, somebody would have to come to Kansas City, get this special permit, to save what? $3? four dollars when they go to the Sprint Center maybe but I, I, I it, it looks like pandering it looks like a feel-good measure I don't think it's going to dent the city coffers. Steve, and a quick caveat here this is for decorated veterans not for all veterans neck like a small a far smaller pool of people. That's a good point. Okay, well, I wanted you to know, though, that we do care about veterans on this program. That's why we are partnering at KCPT with the National World War I Museum this weekend to bring you the Telling Project, where veterans themselves give voice to their experiences. And you get a chance to go to one of those performances, get the details and the ticket prices. It's free for KCPT members at theworldwar.org. That's it for this week's program. Our thanks to our news reviewers from KCUR-FM, 11 to noon on Up to Date, Steve Kraske, Steve Ockrott from The Pitch. Two to six, as 50% of Dana and Parks on 98.1 FM KMBZ, Scott Parks. And uh, whenever important news is happening in the Kansas City Star, you can always rely on Dave Helling to be there. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.